Revelation chapter 2. Let's take a look at what Jesus would say to the church in Thyatira. Are you happy to be in church today? Yeah. I am so stoked to be here. More importantly, I am so stoked my wife is home. It is such a blessing to have a wife in the house when you have at least a dozen kids, it feels, sometimes. And my wife is home from holiday, and I'm in a very good mood. You can't tell yet, but I'm in a really good mood. Take a look at the church in Thyatira. Uh, Revelation chapter 2. Verse 18, this is what Jesus said to the church in Thyatira. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love, and faith, and service, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works and I will strike her children dead and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the mind and heart and I will give to each of you according to your works but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan to you I say I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my words until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you have an ear this morning? Are you here this morning with not just audible organs attached to the side of your head that have the capability of picking up sounds and vibrations that, that are communicated to the brain as, as mere noise, or do you have the spiritual faculty to hear the words of the Spirit? Every single letter that Jesus will, will commission and author to the seven churches throughout Asia Minor will come with this tagline, let he who has an ear, who has an ear to hear, let him hear then what the Spirit says to the churches. Not every, not every ear has the capability of hearing spiritual things. Many ears are carnal. Many ears can only hear and be satisfied and be nurtured and be warmed and encouraged by carnal things. And many seek after those things. In fact, Paul will warn his son in the faith, Timothy, that in the latter times, people will not stand sound teaching. They will chase after preachers and teachers who will scratch their itching ears. A whole generation of people, not only in Paul's day, but undoubtedly in our day as well, would rather have someone speak soothing things to them, speak things of peace and comfort and, and things of ease than true biblical gospel repentance. There's two ears. There's the ear that hears carnal things, and there's the ear that has the capability of hearing the voice of the Spirit. If you have that ear this morning, if God, by the power of the gospel and the unction of the Holy Spirit, has so empowered you to hear with the ear of faith, I ask you this morning to listen to what Jesus is saying to the church in Thyatira. This is a terribly, a terribly difficult place to live in the city of Thyatira. It's the smallest of all the cities that we're going to look at in the seven letters to the churches in Revelation. It's the most insignificant, but it gets the biggest and the greatest letter. It's the most, it's the most insignificant city and the smallest uh, struggling church, but Jesus spends more time with them than any other church of any other city. How often are God's priorities absolutely antithetical to the priorities of the carnal mind? 
We might think of the great cities and the, and, and the great churches built by the apostles in the great places like Ephesus. We talked about Ephesus weeks ago now. We talked about how Ephesus had Paul the Apostle, had Apollos, it had John, it had Timothy. It every bit had all the great celebrities of the first century of Christianity. And yet Jesus issues to them the warning that unless you restore your first love, you will be altogether removed from the presence of Jesus Christ. The city of Thyatira was a difficult place to live. It was basically built in a valley and it was essentially unguarded. It was, it was very difficult to live there because every army that was marching through the region of what every, whatever ideology or whatever allegiance the army had, it would always conquer this city. This city was basically indefensible, and every conquering army that came by swept through, conquered it, and sacked it and destroyed many of its citizens. It was a hard place to build a fortune. It was a hard place to build a life. It was a hard place to be settled, and it's here that Paul the Apostle plants a church. We know in the the book of Acts, it's actually Lydia who is converted to the faith, and she's from Thyatira. She's someone who who sells and markets purple cloth. This is a city of tradespeople. Most of the people in this city work at trade. They are smiths, and they build things, not only things of utility, but also things like idols. And we also understand that in the city of Thyatira, the number one worship in this city is actually Apollos, the sun god. Not only the sun god, but Apollos was called the son of Zeus, the child of Zeus. The the very preeminent title of Apollos was that he was born of the great god Zeus and he was worshipped in Thyatira. It's no mistaking then that Jesus opens up his letter by saying this, To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write this, the words of the Son of God. You you think in Thyatira you're worshipping the true God and God's true Son, but you're worshipping nothing more than a demon. And now the true Son of God, the, the very Son of God, the infinite, eternal Son of the Almighty Jehovah is writing a letter to you. Time to pay attention. Jesus then deals directly with the heresy, the error, the paganism of the city in Thyatira. Jesus describes himself. He says that he has eyes that are like a flame of fire and feet that are burnished bronze, that are, that are every bit uh, bronze that have been baked and cooked and melted and, and formed together to be profoundly indomitable. These, these, this imagery is, is, is exciting and, and confronting and encouraging. Eyes that are of fire is descriptive of the eyes of Jesus Christ, which actually see everything as it really is. And you and I, we don't. We don't see things as they really are. And not only do we not see things as they really are, we very rarely tell things or show things or enact things as they really are. It's very rare we tell people what we really, really think. It's it's very rare we give people the emphasis of what we're really thinking about them or about what they said or about what they're doing or about what we're feeling. We often cloak what we do in a disguise of political correctness and diplomacy. That's how... We get along in society. That's how we get along in church. If you really told the person next to you what you really thought of their singing this morning, we might have some division to work on here in this church. Our eyes don't see like Jesus' eyes see. Our eyes see people, but we don't see their motives. We hear their words, but we can't discern their heart. We can see their actions, but very rarely do we truly get insight into who people really are. Ah, you know, a young couple can a young couple can get together and fall in love and date for two, three, four years and finally get married. And, and I can do their pre-marriage counseling week after week after week. And then after being married for three months, she comes running to me, Craig, he's not the man I married. And my answer is, yes, he is love. He's exactly the man you married. But your eyes were tainted with affection and love. Or the guy comes and he screams, Craig, she's changed. No, she hasn't changed. This is the woman you've given your vow to be united with forever. But Jesus has the eye of fire. 
That means that his eye is able to burn through impurities and falsities and and difficulties and, and see the very core of everything that we are. And how much would we really shudder if it became a reality this morning that everything we thought this week, everything we thought, not guarded by outward actions or words or or figures of speech or, or gesticulation, everything we thought at the kernel of how it was thought, with the emphasis with what it was thought, was publicly displayed for everyone here to see this morning. Could you imagine if every thought we had this week about everyone, everything around us was publicly broadcast for all to see? If you're not If you're not concerned by that, then oh, how little you know yourself. All of us should have a moment of trepidation when we realize that if our our spouse knew what we really thought in that moment of anger or frustration or difficulty, or if our neighbor really knew what we thought, we're happy to smile and wave as we drive past their driveway, but what what we really think, right? What we really, really think, if every thought... If every intent of the heart, if every motivation was publicly displayed for the world to see, all of us, all of us would tremble at the thought. Every private act, every private deed, every private thought. And here's the reality, friends. Here it is this morning. Jesus sees it all. Everything. Everything for what it really is. You know, it's true. Not even you and I really know really, really know our motives at times. Not even, not even you or I can really discern the, the reality of our heart and, 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 and can truly see who we are at the core of it all. Not, not even you and I can really know ourselves as Jesus knows ourselves. And this is the statement that Jesus makes. Not only do I have the eye of fire and can see past every, every pretension and every inhibition and every false display of affection, not only does Jesus say, can I see through it and past it, but I can trample it under my feet. I have feet that are like burnished bronze. He's the all-conquering Lord. Sovereign his scepter sways and none, listen carefully this morning, none can stay his hand. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. He sees all, he knows all, and he tramples where he Wills. At this moment, the entire city of Thyatira and every citizen here this morning of the Christian church should have a moment of trepidation and tremble as we get this grand, overawing view of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Here he is. Here he is. He sees all. He knows all. He tramples all. There is not a single enemy that will not one day be nothing more than a place for Jesus to rest his feet. Such is the sovereign Lord. And that's just how he introduces himself. He hasn't even spoken to the church just yet. But verse 19 takes, a, it takes an encouraging turn. Verse 19, Jesus says, Now you know I have the eyes that see everything, not only the externalities, but the internalities, everything through and through, upstairs, downstairs, inside out, I see it all. I know your works, he says. Your love, faith, and servants, and service, and patient endurance. Take note of this line, and that your latter works exceed the first. This is amazing. This is incredible. The Christians of Thyatira are absolutely an anomaly, aren't they? They're an anomaly because we already looked at the letter to the church in Ephesus, and we already saw that Jesus warned them, you have departed your first love, therefore repent and turn again to the works you did at first. Go back, restore, come back to that place of infatuation for Jesus when zeal consumed you. Don't let theological exactitude numb the blade of your zealous edge. Never let that happen. And that's what happened to the Ephesian church, isn't it? That's exactly what happened to the Ephesian church. They got so good at theology, which I'm a fan of. Let's all get good at theology, people. It's no excuse for being ignorant. But they got so good that they started to take their satisfaction, they started to take their identity, they started to take their stock from how good they were at correctly articulating the Christian faith. And they had actually forsaken zealous, enthusiastic, white-hot love for Jesus, the lost 
our friends, our neighbors, even our enemies. But the Thyatira Christians are not like that. In fact, in fact, stunningly, Jesus says, I know your love, I know your faith, I know your service, and I know your patient endurance. You've got all these things. I mean, who among us this morning could, could extend a proud hand and say, I've basically nailed every one of those. I'm really good at love, faith, patient endurance, service, and patience. Really good at that stuff. I would hope that humility would have the better part of valor this morning. Not only were the Thyatira Christians great at that, but they were greater than they were at day one. We talked about this, this phenomena, didn't we? We talked about this when we looked at the Ephesian letter, the phenomena of coming to faith, of, of being in, in, endued with faith and love for the gospel and finding out that, that Christ has died for you and is buried and is risen for you and your sins are forgiven. You've got peace with God and eternal life forever and how the new Christian, how often it's the case that the new Christian is overwhelmed with enthusiasm because of what they've just learned. But how after a while the Christian church gets to them a little bit, the, their Christian neighbors get to them, their, their well-meaning Christian friends get to them, just calm down, just calm down. But not the Christians in Thyatira. In fact, they came to faith they came to faith, and then from coming to faith, they were only ever growing and, and expanding and exciting in their zeal to live for Jesus Christ. I don't know if I've ever, ever seen a Christian church that does this, but here's one. Stunning as it is, here's one. Here's a Christian church that the moment they came for faith, the moment they came to faith, sorry, they were overwhelmed with zeal, yes, and they only grew in it as they grew all the more in their love and their knowledge and their desire to be like Jesus Christ. They grew all the more in outward works, works of love, compassion, works of justice and patient endurance. But it only lasts a verse. It's an amazing tribute to this church, but it might be possible, it might be possible that the Christians in Thyatira, it might be possible they were too patient. It might be possible that they were too loving, that they were too tolerant. They, they were increasing in these Christian virtues and, and full props to them, great, but they, were, they weren't really being circumspect. And so Jesus then says, I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman, Jezebel. Is there, is there a more distasteful female name in the Bible than Jezebel? Right? I, it's almost grounds for divorce if your husband calls you Jezebel. It's not, right? It's not. I, I've got a robust theology on divorce. Don't worry about that. But you get, what I'm, you get the emphasis here. This woman's name's not actually Jezebel, just to be clear about that. There's no, no Jewish families having a beautiful little baby girl and saying, what should we call it? Well, I'm just really, I'm really feeling Jezebel fits, right? That's not a good start to parenthood. It's not a, it's not a good start to your child's life. It's a, it's a bad beginning for that kid. So this woman's name's probably not actually Jezebel, but with the identification of Jezebel, who was Ahab's wife in the Old Testament, she was a pagan, a Canaanite, and she had convinced the Israelites to engage in debaucherous lifestyle and pagan worship. So Jesus calls this woman in the church Jezebel. She's a Jezebel. So let's look at this. He, he says, you have tolerated that woman who calls herself a prophetess and she's teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat foods sacrificed to idols. You know, the city of Thyatira was full of guilds. It was full of these social cliques and networks that in reality, if you weren't part of one, you couldn't really survive in the city. You couldn't engage in trade. You couldn't buy. You couldn't sell. You couldn't really travel. You couldn't employ. You couldn't be employed. The whole city was basically governed and controlled by these social networks, these guilds, so to speak. So much so that if you weren't part of one of these guilds, then you were outside what was considered the community of the city. And if you were in one of the guilds, then you were guaranteed 
prosperity. It's almost, it, it, it's almost like if you're in the guild, you, you are essentially guaranteed some form of livelihood. It's almost, it's almost like being part of the Freemasons in a sense, but more idolatrous. Because when you're part of one of these guilds, what is mandatory for membership in the guild is to attend the pagan feasts, which often started with eating meat sacrificed to the idol and ended in a feverish, debauched orgy. That's how the things usually played out. So there's a woman in the church. Whatever her name is, we don't know. Perhaps it's a grace that Jesus doesn't call her by name because remember, this letter is traveling to the city of Thyatira to be read out to the whole church from Jesus himself and it would get super, super awkward when Jesus is about to give this woman a chance to repent. So he calls her Jezebel. Everyone probably knows who the Jezebel is, but Jesus gives her this one final slither of grace. And so she is, there she is in the church, there she is in the church. And she's starting to convince the believers that, you know what, we can't really function or survive in this city unless we come to terms with some form of compromise. And she started to recruit people into her particular guild where she would bring them along to the feasts where they would eat sacrificial meat and then engage in sexual immorality seducing them. Jesus used this, this powerful word. She begins to seduce them, to use the grace of God as a license to sin, to use the grace of God as a license to sin, to believe that although we are saved on account of nothing we do, our works have got nothing to do with our salvation. There is the pernicious error. There is the deadly error. Oh, to be, to be so evangelical that we die on this hill of justification over and against any and all of my works. To be saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Oh, to die on that hill, but not to fail to recognize that your works will have bearing on your judgment one day before a just and holy God. Overemphasis over here creates massive errors over here. And there's Jezebel, a self-proclaimed prophetess. Now, most of you are mature enough as a Christian now to know that when, that when that business card slides across the table, you shut down. Praise God, right? Well, I'm a, I don't know if you know this, but I'm actually a prophet. So I'm kind of hearing from God. I'm, I'm just downloading stuff all the time. Look, here's, here's my website, my YouTube videos. Check me out, and I'm bringing the word of God. Most of you know at this point that we should have a high sensitivity and skepticism at that moment. Someone claiming to be speaking for God, someone self-claiming to be speaking for God, there could be nothing more noxious than that, right? If you are speaking from God, then hopefully the duly ordained leadership of a church has endorsed you and has given you that, that credit to stand and speak, not some, not some airy-fairy, unsubmitted rogue of a person marching around claiming to have all the authority of the very voice of God, but no submission or character to go along with it. You know, you know who I'm talking about. You know who I'm talking about. So here she is, she, she's at the church, at the potluck after the service, at, at, at the fellowship dinner, and she's just, she's just popping business cards in people's pockets. I'm the prophetess, I'm the one the Spirit is uniquely speaking to. I'm not saying the elders here aren't doing a great job. I'm not saying the pastor here is not doing his best, but he doesn't have the Spirit like I have it. So come along to my home group and, and come and meet just, just for prayer. There's, there's, there's no harm done. We're just going to get together and pray. And slowly yet surely, the undermining of the authority of the church begins to happen. Never here. Never here. Not while I'm here. But this is how it happens. So Jezebel starts to welcome people into the guild. And at first, it seems like the Christian citizens of Thyatira are pretty excited about this because she presents membership in the guild in Christian terms, in Christian phrases, in Christian ideology. And as she does this, she helps them to realize that if you're part of a guild, your life is far better. If you're part of the social network, you can succeed in the city of Thyatira. And then when they arrive at the feast, they realize it's no different than any other guild. And so on, they begin begin to practice the debauched acts of sin and heinous wickedness. And so it is. So it is. The rogue prophet always leads 
to sin. Let me, let me say it again, real clear, so you all can hear me this morning. The rogue prophet always leads to sin. In this dispensation of the Lord reigning at the right-hand side of his Father and the Spirit falling and pouring out upon his church, there is no higher authority on planet Earth today than the local Christian church. Be very clear about that. Ecclesiology makes all the difference. And so it did at Thyatira. These elders, I don't know what they were doing. I don't know what they were thinking. But they just let this play out. They just let this whole thing play out. And Jesus is furious. Let's take a look at what he, what he says here. Verse 21, Jesus says, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. Jesus is not playing around with this. We talked about this a little bit last week, didn't we? We talked about how we saw church discipline endorsed by Jesus. No, we need, a, we need a stronger verb. Commanded by Jesus in the New Testament church. In the Christian church of this age, church discipline is commanded by Jesus Christ. So here it is. This letter is to the church, to the elders, to the members, to the people, to the visitors. This letter is to the church, and here it is. You better shape up. You better wise up. You better do something about this self-proclaimed prophetess, or I'm coming to throw her into the agony of illness and kill the people she has seduced. Some of you thought we were pretty severe here with church discipline. Some of you thought we were a little bit heavy-handed with church discipline. Some of you forgot what Paul says to the Corinthian church when they were consuming the Lord's Supper without, without being aware of the body of the Lord. They were consuming it unworthily, he says. Paul says to this church in Corinth, and what scandal this would be today if someone stood up and said this in the church of today. What scandal it would be today, right? If someone said, you know why, you know why that family got ill? You know why, they, you know why Aunt Jane or, or Uncle Jack or whoever, you know why that person died last month? They came forward to the communion table and they partook of the emblems, the bread and the wine. They partook of the body and blood of the Lord and they did so in an unworthy manner. Paul literally says to the church in Corinth, people are getting sick and dying in the church because they are unrepentantly abusing the ordinance of communion. Where has recognition of that gone in the preaching of the Christian church today? And, and here it is in the book of Revelation, just in case we thought, you know what, Paul's had a pretty bad day. Paul's pretty frustrated with the Corinthian church. He's reached fever pitch and he's anger and he just can't control it anymore. But here's Jesus saying, if unrepentant sin continues in the Christian community, Jesus will come and he will strike people dead. That's what he'll do. Now, of, co of course, God has not given the elders of the church, church discipline of that nature. Right? Of course. But this is the warning to the whole church in Thyatira. Deal with this woman. Deal with the unrepentant rogue prophet in your midst who is convincing people that they can do whatever they like and it doesn't worry God at all. That even though they're justified by grace through faith, not according to works, they can live however they please and their works have no bearing on God's observation of them. What a dangerous what a pernicious, what a wicked and cancerous error this is. And the sin of Jezebel and the sin of Jezebel's children, not, probably not literally her children, but her followers, was affecting the entire church. Everyone was being affected. Stop for a moment. Stop. Everyone, listen to this carefully. Your sin, your unrepentant sin, your habitual sin is affecting all of us, so repent. Repent. Listen carefully, he who has an ear to hear. You, you may think, I'm good. You know, no one really knows. It's just something I do with my laptop once the wife's in bed. I'm good. It's just, it's just something I do Friday afternoon when, when the bank's closing and the, the business is shutting and everyone's left and I just grab a little bit from the till. This is, it's all good. This is, this is something I do online. No one can see it. I'm just taking this media. I know I should be paying the copyright. I get it. Everyone does it. I'm just, I, I get it, but it's, it's fine. I'm, no one knows I'm good. Jesus is saying right now, right now in this letter, that the sin of individual members 
the unrepentant sin, the habitual sin of individual members in a church community affects the whole community in ways you would never know. In ways you could never fathom. You, you, you think you're fine. You think you're fine. I mean, as long as you don't do it Saturday night, right? Because it's hard to come to church Sunday morning after having a bad Saturday night. But Wednesday night's fine, and, and Monday night's fine, and Friday night's particularly fine. You think that you can show up, and it affects nobody. But Jesus says otherwise, it does affect people. It affects all of us. It damages all of us. It, it infiltrates our worship. It infiltrates our peace. It affects us. We are an organism. We are a body. More than that, we are the body of Jesus Christ. When one of us is broken, we are all suffering. You got sin in your life? Unrepentant sin, habitual sin, sin that can't be break. The good news of the gospel is this. If you repent, you shall be forgiven of all, all, all your sins. And God, who is faithful and just, shall forgive them all. And so he says in verse 22, Jesus says, I'm going to throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw them into great tribulation unless they repent of their works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each according to your works. It's incredible how often that that phrase comes. It's incredible how much it's repeated here. How much sometimes we've we've suffered because we've we've drank the Kool-Aid and that's, we've sculled it. We haven't drank it. We've we've guzzled the Kool-Aid. That what we do doesn't really matter. I mean, God's faithful. God's loving. God is enduring. God is patient. God's not angry at anybody. Wrong. The Bible says that's Wrong. Can we for a moment let Jesus speak for himself? Unrepentant sin brings sickness, brings death, brings destruction to the church. So it is. So it is, and Jesus warns. We move on now and we take a look here at verse 24. But to the rest of you in Thyatira. So this was a small group. This, this was still a minority. It was, a, it was an influential minority. It was contaminating the church like a, like a single cancer cell can destroy an entirely healthy body, but it was small. It was a minority. And so Jesus goes on to address the rest of the Christians in the city of Thyatira. And he says, to those who do not hold this teaching and have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. I love this line. I love this line because Jesus is being facetious. I say facetious because some of you aren't comfortable with me saying Jesus is being sarcastic. But he is being sarcastic. Because there's no way that Jezebel and her motley crew are getting around saying that they're teaching the deep things of Satan. Hard to recruit Christians like that, right? Isn't it? Hard to get people on board. Come and join our cell group. I know you normally go to that cell group, but ours is more deeper, more profound. We've got, we teach secret things. We see things in the Bible that no one else sees. Deep things. Just like the other week when we looked at the church in Smyrna, and we saw that Jesus spoke of the Jewish synagogue proudly erected in the city of Smyrna. He called them nothing more than a synagogue of Satan. He does the same thing here. Here you are, rogue prophetess, recruiting and building and, and pulling people together who are weak in faith, or immature, people who are wavering and aren't super, super grounded in the gospel, pulling them away into your group, claiming that you're teaching them deep and profound and overwhelmingly secret things. Jesus calls them the deep things of Satan. That's what they are. They're the deep things of Satan. You, know, you want to know what the Greek word for Satan is? Satan. Pretty profound, right? Not super deep though, is it? Because here it is, ladies and gentlemen, here it is this morning. There's black and there's white. There's night and there's day. There's the lordship of Christ and the kingdom of Satan. There's no in between, no middle ground. You are either saved or you are condemned. You are either alive or you are dead. And it doesn't matter how profound someone wants to make them sound, right? How recondite their, their language and macabre their figure of speech is. And oh, this, people sees, this person sees things in the Bible that no one's ever seen before. Then they are a heretic. Just to be really clear. I don't know. Can you tell I'm in a good mood this morning? Just to be really clear. Right? If, you, if you're reading your Bible, I think I, I, think I stole this from R.C. Sproul. If you're, if you're reading your Bible... 
and you see a passage and you come up with an interpretation of what it says, that 2,000 years of Christianity, no one's ever seen that before, read that before, wrote that before. All the heroes of the faith of the first century, the apostles, the disciples, the, the patristic fathers, the, 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 the medieval uh, theologians and scribes, the, the great reformers, magisterial and, and other, all the people of, of the modern revivalist movements. Of the, if no one's ever seen your interpretation before, your recommendation for you is to abandon it very quickly. Abandon it bad, it's really bad, you're just simply wrong. You haven't all of a sudden been enlightened to know something that 2,000 years of Christianity no one's ever seen before. God wasn't sitting back on his chair, looking at the clock, waiting for you to show up on the scene to give you this private revelation that no one ever seen. You're not that important. I want to be really clear about that this morning. Light, darkness, kingdom of Christ, kingdom of Satan. So he speaks facetiously. He says to them, he says, you have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. Now, they're not really, again, they're not really calling it that, but this is Jesus throwing the dagger in the back just so you can feel it for what it is. Uh, to you, I say, to the people who haven't gone along with this, this error, this heresy, he says, to you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden, any other burden than deal with the error in the midst. Except this, hold fast, verse 25, hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod, a rod of iron and when earthen, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. What imagery this is. And Christ is returning. He's returning in glory and he's returning to establish his kingdom in glory. And those who overcome, those who conquer, we've seen that every letter has a different reward for the faithful. You have to be faithful to the truth of Scripture. Faithful to what Scripture reveals. To resist the temptation to run off with the right wing or the left wing or, or, or the obscure group out there over there teaching the weird and wonderful things. No matter, how, no matter how fantastic or overtly miraculous their meetings seem to be, remain faithful, steadfast, stay firm. Don't go, stay firm in the Christian family. Don't run to and fro like a wind-whipped wave stirred up by the ocean, frothing up your shame, as Jude says. Stay firm and overcome. To that person, Jesus says, I will give the right to rule nations. Not, uh, not to rule them in name only, not just to be kind of like some, some kind of figurehead monarch, like some, some powerless in name only nominal king or queen, but to rule them with a rod of iron, to actually rule them, to smash them like you might with earth, earthen pots, clay pots. You might take a rod of iron and you might smash them. And Jesus says the right to judge in the kingdom of the world to come will be yours if you overcome. If you stay faithful, if you stay firm in your conviction of the faith, if you repent of habitual indwelling sin, if you overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony of Jesus Christ, you will rule nations. He goes on and says, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. Verse 28, the most profound of all. We close out here. And for me, really, at the bottom of my heart, I wish verse 28 could just be its own sermon. I just, I just wish we could just dwell on verse 28. Look at the promise. To the one who overcomes, the one who conquers, the one who succeeds by the grace of God, Jesus says, I will give him the morning star. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand this. He's not promising to give you a star in the sky. That would kind of be meaningless. In fact, right now, you can, well, not now, but tonight, you can go out if you like and point at one and put your name on it if you like. It's kind of meaningless, right? That's your star. Oh, well, no one cares. It changes nothing. So what's the promise here? Well, if you know your Bible, you know the phrase, the morning star is actually a title. It's, it, it's not so much a, a thing, it is actually a title. It's, it, it belongs. It's, a, it, it, it's an appellation that belongs to the, the conquering Lamb of God. It's a title for Jesus Christ. 
And First Peter has said that the day is coming when the morning star will rise in our hearts. And Jesus promises right here, right here in verse 28 of Revelation chapter 2, that he will give you the morning star. You know, this is, this is why it all matters. All these other promises are awesome. Look at the things we've, we've looked at. We've seen that we get a, a crown of victory. We've seen that we get a, a, a pure white stone with a name written on it that no one knows. And, 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 and we get manna from heaven and we, we get welcome to the banquet of the Lamb. We get, we get eternal life. We get all these incredible things that are appended to salvation. But they are in reality still the appended part. Because the core of salvation is the same promise that God gave to Abraham when he said, Behold, I am your shield, your everlasting reward. It's him. God is it. God in Jesus Christ is your eternal possession if you overcome the most amazing, awe-inspiring, awesome, sovereign, eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, inexhaustibly perfect being who's ever existed, God is your reward. He's yours. This is the promise of it all. Everything else in Christianity, as great as it is, and it's all great, it's the package, it's the wrapper, it's the design and the display, it's not the thing in it of itself. In the gospel, God gives himself. First in Christ on the cross. What do we need to be saved? What do we need to be forgiven? Us imperfect, fallen, sinful people. What do we need? We need a substitute that is infinitely perfect and sin free. Who wants to go out on a survey today and try and find one? Who wants to ask around your neighbors and your friends? Who wants to ask around your hobby group or your social group? Try and find someone who's infinitely perfect and yet is willing to consume the eternal wrath of a holy God. Who wants to, wants to go on that excursion? Nobody wants to do that. To find a substitute that is infinitely perfect and yet so loving, they would lay down their entire perfect life so that you can be saved is an impossibility at the deepest point. So that's the good news of the gospel, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him will not perish but have eternal, everlasting, unending, all-conquering, victorious life. God provided the substitute. His own son, Jesus Christ, the introduction to our letter this morning, the son of God came to this earth, born in our form, in our clay, in, our, in, in, in every way like us, born of a virgin woman, lived perfect and sin free. And at the end of his life, he died on the cross and consumed the wrath and vengeance of a holy God for every single person who trusts in him. Salvation is free and available to all who simply trust in him. He has died to pay the debt that we owe and he has risen for our justification. This is the promise. God gives himself in the gospel. God sees we have no hope in and of ourselves. And God sees we have no hope if he sends an angel, if he sends another prophet, if he gives another holy book, no matter what God does, he could send a billion stars to save us and it does not pay the bill. The only thing that pays the bill is the sin-free blood of the holiest man who ever walked the earth, Jesus Christ. He dies. He is buried. He is risen so that all who trust, all who take hold, all who stand upon his promise, all who give their life in surrender to him will be saved. And they get more than salvation. They get more than an escape from hell and a free ticket to heaven, to the banquet with the crown and the scepter and the ruling of nations. They get all that and they get God as their eternal prize. If only we had time this morning to labor this point, but we don't. Let's hear the warning as it stands. Verse 29, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Would you close your eyes and bow your head this morning? We're going to pray. Ask God to bless our time around his word. You're so good to us, Father. You're so, you're so good to us beyond what we could ever ask, imagine, or think. 
I, I pray, Father, for your grace. Help us, help us with the eye of faith to see, to see these great and precious promises that are all yes in Christ. All yes and amen in the Savior of sinful men. This morning, Father, help us to, to take this letter, to take it deep into our heart and our life and to meditate on this content. Church life matters. Church community matters. Church togetherness matters. And because it does, Father, we have learned through this letter that it really matters to practice discipline. That it really matters to weed out those among us who might go out of their way to lead people astray. To weed out from among us those who go out of their way to compel people to sin. And I pray that our hearts would be excited this morning, Father, to honor you, to be like the church in Thyatira, who only ever increase in their zeal, who only ever grow in their enthusiasm, who are only ever doing more works than the day they did before, more love than last week, more grace than last year, who are always growing from strength to strength. I pray we could, be, we could be like that. I pray we could be a thriving, growing Christian community. And although we might wonder, Jesus, what would you write to us? What, would, what kind of letter would you write to us? Help us to take these letters in Revelation, apply them to our lives and our church, and grow thereby all to your glory. We pray finally, Father, for those in our midst this morning who are yet to really trust in Jesus Christ, who have spent their life pretending, who've spent their life manipulating those around them and manipulating the system, trying to get by without really surrendering to Christ. May their hearts be aglow this morning with this word, that if they would only come, if they would only trust, if they would only give themselves to Christ, He will save them and He will be their reward, their everlasting shield. Thank you for grace upon these people this morning, Father. Thank you for all who are yet to believe that this morning they would put their trust in Christ. And for those of us who already believe, we would be stirred again today to greater works of love and sacrifice. In Jesus' name, and all who agreed said, Amen.